Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. Well, today we have the pleasure of speaking with David Quammen. You introduced me to him via his book, Spillover, which is really quite prescient for the moment we find ourselves in. It certainly is. Uh, he writes about zoonotic diseases and diseases that jump from animals to people. He wrote a lot about Ebola and SARS and MERS, and he talked a lot about coming pandemics, especially ones with coronaviruses. Well, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say about the moment we're in now and um, what we can learn about it that actually relates to what we teach in integrative medicine. Well, I think especially the environmental uh, ramifications of this, because a major point in the book is that the reasons that zoonotic diseases are becoming more frequent and more serious is entirely due to human causes. Let's get David on. All right. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce David Quammen. He's an author, a journalist, and his books include The Song of the Dodo, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, and particularly relevant to this moment in time, Spillover, which is a work on the science, history, and human impacts of emerging diseases. He's written essays and columns for magazines, including Harper's, National Geographic, Esquire, The Atlantic, and The Rolling Stone. And David has been called our greatest living chronicler of the natural world by the New York Times. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you, Andy. Very good to be with you. I enjoyed your book very much. I uh, learned a lot from it. Thank you. And thank you for using the word enjoyed, which <laughs> I know is uh, uh, perhaps needs to go in scare quotes for this particular book. But still, I love hearing it because I want it to be a book that is a page turner as well as uh, simply informative. Yep. Well, I think you did a remarkable job. Um, I want to be sure that our listeners know what we're talking about because they may not yet have read Spillover. Maybe you could start by just explaining what are zoonotic diseases? Right. So Spillover is a book about zoonotic diseases. A zoonotic disease, a zoonosis is an animal infection that's transmissible to humans. Could be a virus, could be a bacterium, anything that that is an infective microbe. and uh, if a virus, for instance, is passed from a non-human animal into a, into a human, causes disease and transmits, then we call that a zoonotic disease. And it's not a fringe uh, subject out on the, on the edge of medicine. It's pretty central because at least 60% of our known infectious diseases in humans uh, fall into this category. They are, they are zoonotic diseases. And, and the other 40, in a looser sense, could be considered zoonotic too because everything comes from somewhere, and we're a relatively young species. Give us an example or several examples of recent zoonotic diseases that people will have heard about and perhaps gotten frightened by. Right. Well, the, some of the most infamous would include Ebola. Ebola is a virus, belongs to the phyloviridae group, and it comes out of animals in Central Africa and West Africa and gets into humans and causes you know, terrible misery and death. Um, Nipah virus in Malaysia emerged in 1998. We've all heard about the hantaviruses, particularly those of you in the Southwest, because it was in the Four Corners area of Arizona, New Mexico, when the hantaviruses first emerged in 1992, coming out of a particular hantavirus, coming out of rodents and getting into people and then killing at a very high rate. Going back a little farther, bubonic plague is a zoonotic disease. The plagues of the 14th century by way of uh, lice and getting into people and, and causing mayhem. Even AIDS is a zoonotic disease in the sense that we now understand that um, the pandemic strain of HIV, HIV-1 group M, passed as originally a chimpanzee virus, a simian virus, passed from a single chimpanzee into a single human in the southeastern corner of Cameroon back around 1908, give or take a margin of error. And then it had this sort of secret history for decades, slowly transmitting from one human to another until it got to some of the big cities of the Congo River and then from there to the world. 
So zoonotic diseases have, uh, and, and I haven't even mentioned influenza, which they, those are also zoonotic diseases. So there's a big footprint on human history and human health. Expressing your concern about how these zoonotic diseases may actually become much, much more prevalent moving into the future. Do you want to introduce that for our listeners? Mm. Yes, well, this is, uh, you know, David addresses, but it's very clear that the recent appearance of zoonotic diseases and their potential to get worse and affect people, this is human cause, and that there are many human activities that are contributing to the spillover of these diseases from animals to humans. You know, among them, climate change, deforestation, agricultural practices, our eating habits, moving into habitats that humans previously weren't in, having closer contact with animals. I mean, there's so many uh, factors like this. Also, I think a root problem is overpopulation and increased population density, that more and more people are living in crowded situations in cities. All of this favors the uh, appearance of these diseases. I couldn't agree with him more. All of those things, including the population size and the population density that he mentioned at the very end, I also would include among the, the drivers of this. I, I think of there being three huge problems that we face on this, this planet in terms of the way we live with the rest of the planet, the way we live with the natural world and the consequences for us. And those are climate change, uh, the threat of pandemic disease, and loss of biological diversity. And they all, they, they converge at their causes. They all come from the same causes. And those are the causes that Andy just listed. Which of those can we do anything about? You know, it's not at all clear, uh, given there's still a lot of people out there that deny the climate exists. Yeah. Uh, many people would have no awareness that their eat choices affect uh, the potential for zoonotic diseases to appear. Which of these things is there a chance of modifying? That's a hard question. I think that um, the beginning uh, of the way to answer that question is to think about this horrible event that's happening to us now, horrible for humans and horrible for, for economies, horrible for people who have to make a living every day, this pandemic. We have to think about it a little bit oxymoronically as, um, as an opportunity for major change as well as a, as a, great, a great tragedy. Tragedy in the, in, in the technical Greek sense because it uh, uh, results from our own choices. Um, well, I hope it's a wake-up call, and I hope it's a practice run that we begin to think about changing our ways. Yes. It's, it's almost unimaginable to me that we could come out the far side of this and then not look back and say, well, that was terrible. We've got to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, that even the people who tend to be deniers of science, deniers of climate change, deniers of the, of the importance of the loss of biological diversity, even just the inherent uh, importance of that. It's almost unimaginable to me that after this, people could still be in denial on those points. However, I have to, let me tell you one quick story. I grew up in Philadelphia and my, I was born in 1942 and my father's mother lived with us. She had lived through the 1918 flu pandemic and Philadelphia was the hardest hit city. And she told me stories of horse-drawn carts of corpses going the streets of Philadelphia. That had a very powerful effect on my young mind. And I tried to ask people about it and find information, and nobody, there was nothing out there. This was like in the 1950s. Yeah. It is astonishing to me that there was a general cultural repression of that event, that it was so horrific that people just stuffed it away. And it wasn't until relatively recently that scientists took any and what was that? Why did it act that way? You know, it was many years went by and people paid no attention to it. That's right. It was peculiar to me too. Uh, I mean, I grew up, yeah, I'm just a little bit younger than you. I grew up in the 50s, uh, in the 60s, and it's, you were never aware that there was this huge event in, in human history, yeah. including American history, that, that began in 1918 rather than ending in 1918. Yeah. And then there were books like John Barry's very good book on um, the, the pandemic of 1918, 1919, and a few other things. I'm not sure when, I, when the light bulb went on for me, but there was a light bulb. It's like, what? Yeah. And, and when I was first reading about it, they were saying 20 million people had died. And I was, what? 20 million <laughs> people died from something I've never heard of? And now they're saying 50 million 50, or more. Yeah, or more. Um, and of course, it was tricky because... 
nobody knew viruses existed until the 1930s. So this was a huge cataclysmic disaster caused by not just an inv invisible agent in the literal sense, but something that was sort of mystic seeming in those days. Now, it was also before radio, uh, so information did not get around as much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So things are different today in that we are all connected in this worldwide event. Uh, right. So maybe this will make it easier for people to you know, think about. I, I hope so. I'm, I'm reading a book right now called The Rules of Contagion by mm. a, a smart young statistician, I guess he would call himself, named Adam Kucharski. And it's about, it's about understanding how um, not just how diseases pass from one human to another, but how ideas yeah, and yeah, emotions and, emo and yes, emotions and, and some things that you would never expect to be contagious, in fact, are contagious and are all the more contagious now with the great connectivity that we have. Talk to me before we started about my general thoughts on infectious disease. Yeah, yeah. So to me, the most interesting uh, fact is that it's possible to live in a balanced relationship with many of these organisms. Uh, many people think that it, that you get a infection because you're unlucky enough across the path of a bad microbe. Uh, but in fact, there are host factors that really influence the way that microbes behave. One example of that, if you look at Helicobacter pylori, you know, which is so tightly associated with ulcers, stomach ulcers, and, and uh, duodenal ulcers, there are many people walking in who have that organism in their stomachs who have no symptoms and no problems. So it's not just the presence of the organism, it's that there's some change in the host that allows the organism to go on that sort of destructive course. Yeah, that's and, right. And that's and a very interesting fact. And yet, yeah. You know this in the reservoir hosts of many of these diseases, they live with them and don't suffer any harm from them. That's right. That's right. And the idea, yeah, I mean, people tend to think that, well, we want to, uh, you know, we want to use antibiotics and every other tool we can to, um, to rid our bodies of microbes. Now people, of course, and I'm sure you've done shows on this, now people are becoming aware of the microbiome, the fact that we are these complex ecosystems, that we've got more microbial um, cells in our bodies than we have human cells, I think by a factor of somewhere between three and 10. And I'm sure you know more, much more about this than I do, but Helicobacter pylori is now better understood, correct me if I'm wrong on this, as something that you, you do not want to rid your body of that, even though it is associated with ulcers in middle-aged people. It's also part of an ecosystem that keeps you healthy when you're younger. Am, am I roughly right? Yeah, yeah that's right. And that's, that is, to me, a fascinating idea. Also, you know, all of these uh, microorganisms have a place in, in the ecology. Many people think viruses are inherently bad. As with all microbes, it's only a small percentage that are pathogenic. Many of them are probably beneficial. Your work on transmission of genes by viruses, you know, this is very important. We may have acquired many genes through uh, our contact with viruses. Right. Right. And even these viruses that look scary to us, they're, they may have some place in the ecosystem, and there is a potential for our living in a more balanced relationship. Yeah, I agree. We're just beginning to scratch the surface of, of understanding our relationships with, with viruses. Um, and, and as you say, they, among other things, and I wrote about this in my more recent book, The Tangled Tree, viruses, some viruses become endogenous retroviruses, insert themselves into our genomes and stay there. The virus genome becomes part of our genome in some cases that that ha has no apparent function but in some cases including some some viral genomes that were inserted in the mammal lineage very early on they become crucial genes like like a gene known as sensitin number two which is absolutely essential to successful human pregnancy right. uh, creating a, a boundary between the placenta and the fetus that stretch of our dna Oh. is an endogenous retrovirus inserted sometime in the, in the evolution of mammals by a virus that infected us. Fascinating. I often hear people say that it's in the interest of a pathogenic microbe evolved toward being less virulent. 
uh, that it's not in the interest of microbes to kill a high percentage of people. Mm-hmm. And diseases tend to settle down. And in your book, you question and say that that's not necessarily what we observe. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you think will happen with uh, you know, this, this virus? That's Very to- interesting question, yes. Uh, first of all, that is, that is a common belief, uh, sort of a folk belief of people who know a little bit about viral infection. So don't they evolve toward being, don't they sort of become tame? They evolve toward being less virulent over time. And the truth is that yes and no, depending on the case. Some do, some don't. Some might involve, evolve in the other direction. It depends on, um, you know, it's all the ABCs of Darwin. It's evolution by natural selection. And um, viruses, as they replicate, um, their populations contain genetic diversity. And so they're selected by, by competition. And whoever happens to be the best tactic for success is what will be selected for, what will be fixed as an adaptation. And if that means being more virulent so that you send people to bed mm-hmm. more quickly and they're, shed, you know, they're shedding bodily fluids, they've got terrible diarrhea or vomiting or whatever, and that is spreading to their family members, that might be a successful strategy that would be associated with high virulence. If they're walking around like we have with this virus, people who are infected and a shedding virus and they're feeling no symptoms, they're, they're these sort of cryptic silent spreaders, that can also be a very effective um, strategy for a virus. Now, this virus, I've been, I've been reading the, the evolutionary virologists who are looking at this virus from different samples over different periods of time, different places. They're building family trees of this virus. And one of the things they're saying is that this virus it, it's a coronavirus, so it has a relatively high potential evolvability, a high, relatively high mutation rate, not anything like influenza, but relatively high. But it doesn't seem to be changing. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem to be evolving. Why is that? Well, their speculation is because it's already so successful. Uh-huh. It doesn't need to change. It's getting around the world lickety split. It's extending itself in space and time which is what the Darwinian imperative is. Replicate uh, and extend yourself in space and time. That's what natural selection is, yeah. is working to produce, is reinforcing. An interesting case is poliomyelitis. You know, up until the mid-20th century, uh, most people who came into contact with that virus came into contact with it early in life. Uh, and people were living in less hygienic conditions. And early in life, getting that infection caused a diarrheal illness that was of minor consequence. If you came into contact with that virus after the nervous system had matured and was fully myelinated, then there was the potential to get paralytic polio. So it was only when people were living in more hygienic conditions, and this was especially middle-class people and upper middle-class people in, in North America, that there was no contact with the virus until kids got older, and then there were these epidemics of paralytic polio. Yeah. So that's another interest, just an interesting look at that. That you know, the, again, host factors determine Very the way the virus yeah. behaves. Yeah, absolutely. I th- it makes me think of um, my mother's younger brother, my one of my heroes, my uncle Greg, who was a pediatrician in mm-hmm. La Crosse, Wisconsin, in the fifties, and wor- and there was a polio outbreak, and he was working long hours to take care of these kids who had polio, and he got polio. Mm-hmm. And it, and he survived, but it paralyzed his throat, and he couldn't swallow right for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. A wonderful man. Uh, anyway, but yes, that's a, polio is very interesting. And the other thing that's interesting about polio is because is that it has been with us so long that, like smallpox, it is not in the strict sense a zoonotic disease. It is a disease of humans uh-huh. only. So we have eradicated smallpox, and the reason we've come close to eradicating polio is that it has no reservoir in non-human animals. Uh-huh. What's your take on the anti-vaxxers? I, I, this just completely astounds me. Yes, right. Well, I agree. I mean, the consequences of anti-vax passion yeah, right. is going to affect the, all of us. <laughs> yeah, the consequences are great. I mean, yeah. are huge and, and horrible. On the other end, the motivations are hard to imagine, except that there is this streak in the American character or the streak in the American population of, you know, rugged individual, cowboy mentality, ethic, uh, don't tell me what to do, rejection of experts generally, Mm -hmm. rejection of science, um, somewhat more specifically, rejection of evolutionary biology in particular, 
and rejection of the idea of, of vaccines. It's not entirely unique to Americans, but boy, we certainly have no yeah. share of it uh, with, with dire consequences. I mean, I'm, I'm also very interested in the case of, of, of measles, the story of measles. And I think that that's going to have some applicability to our thinking about what's going to happen with this virus, this coronavirus. One thing that struck me when I read Spillover, I think you were totally prescient because you talked about the good luck that humankind had in 2003, but you said it wasn't just good luck, that we had speed and excellence of laboratory diagnostics, that we had brisk efficiency, that cases were isolated and contacts were traced and quarantines were instituted. And we also had a rigor of infection control at hospitals. But the other point you mentioned was that that infection, unlike this one, people had symptoms before they shed the virus. So like you said, they were in bed, they were in hospitals, and they weren't therefore as likely to spread it widely. And yet this coronavirus is the opposite. So how did that happen, that we have the same family, the same coronavirus, but you immediately have shedding even during this asymptomatic period? Yeah. Well, it's a different virus. This is, this is the nightmare virus. Um, for re- for the reason that you just mentioned, plus some other reasons, we don't know uh, yet whether um, exposure to this virus and having had a case of it and surviving it, whether that's going to confer immunity. We don't know that. We know that. Probably, this virus, I would say probably, David. I think. Well, I, I I certainly hope you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I and I take your point that that most um, most scientists and and doctors expect that there will be some immunity because you you know the antibodies are there you can measure antibodies but but we can't guarantee that but um so how is this virus why does it happen to be so so much worse so different well this virus is only about i think it's about 75 percent similar in genome to the sars virus sars cov1 um, this virus is 96 percent similar to a bat virus that was discovered five years ago in, among bats living in a cave in Yunnan province, discovered by a team that included, who was led by a woman named uh, Zheng Li Shi at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And she published in 2017 a paper warning about this virus that she had found. So now the, um, the coronavirus that we have now is, is related to that. It's like a first cousin to the virus that she found. Um, and it's different enough in its genome that it has some different properties. I think that it's been said to um, affect cells of the upper respiratory tract as well as the lower respiratory tract, whereas SARS-1 infected mostly the lower respiratory tract, so that when people really had, they were coughing desperately and spewing and and dispersing this virus. And now it seems that before they start to cough, are dispersing this virus on their breath, on a spoken word, on an exhalation. Uh, possibly because the virus is is occupying these cells much higher in the respiratory tract. This is this is just sort of guesswork on my part, uh, based on some some reading of this, the science and the, the ACE two receptors that this this virus attaches to. But um, but those are certainly um, differences that you're not surprised to find in a coronavirus that has a genome only seventy five percent identical to the, the original SARS. So. Many people believe that the SARS-CoV-2 probably spilled over from a wet market in China. Can you talk about wet markets and bushmeat and what role those play in zoonotic diseases? Wet markets, quote unquote, wet markets generally, uh, the phrase is used for markets where there is a lot of um, fresh food on sale ranging from vegetables through seafood through through meat of domestic animals, through live domestic animals, and on into wild animals. Wild animals bred in captivity, and then at the far extreme, wild animals captured from the wild. And when you put all those things together in a sort of a, a wonderfully robust, chaotic situation under a, you know, under a tin roof somewhere, then you have, first of all, you have a resource for, for people who may be living in a city and they can get fresh food. But on the other hand, you have an absolutely ideal situation for mixing viruses from one species to another. And I've seen some of these wet markets in Africa as well as in China. 
uh, and you may see um, captive uh, wild birds of all sorts in cages for sale, uh, not just as pets, but for food. Um, you can see reptiles, snakes, turtles, tortoises, frogs, toads, mammals of various sorts, wild mammals, civets, pangolins, bamboo rats, bats. When I was in China researching my book, it was one of the periods when Chinese regulations had suppressed the trade in wild animals. So what I saw included much of what I just mentioned, but it did not include wild mammals like bats and pangolins. David, one of the things I learned from your book that I didn't know was that the Chinese preference for eating wild exotic animals is a recent phenomenon. Uh, that this ha it was among wealthy Chinese and it became a, a status symbol to be eating this. It's not a cultural that's, rooted, that's really right. cultural rooted trade. Yeah, it's called the, the era of wild flavor or, or ye mm -hmm. There is some difference of opinion on that. There are some people who are still saying, well, this is an ancient cultural practice. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't criticize it. But there are others who say, including um, a young colleague of mine uh, named Wu Fei Yu, Wu Fei Yu, um, a Chinese a journalist now working in the U.S., and he did an op-ed for the New York Times a couple of months ago, and he looked at that, and he found, you went to the old texts in Chinese, the things that people were loosely saying, oh, this is an ancient tradition, and he found evidence in those old texts that, no, even the, even the old sages were saying, don't eat wild food, you're going to get sick, you know, don't, don't, don't eat wild animals. Was there some use of at least parts of those animals for medicinal purposes? Because that's something I've always heard about traditional Chinese herbal remedies, that they sometimes use some very unusual animal parts yes. for yes. health promotion. Yes. Absolutely. That's right, Victoria. And that ranges, I'm not an expert on this, but that ranges from, from tiger parts um, and bear parts to, uh, to pangolin scales. There's a huge illegal uh, global trade in, in these poor, magnificent animals, pangolins, sometimes known as spiny anteaters. Um, you know, they look like a uh, um, cross between an armadillo and, and an anteater, but they are unique. They are a unique family. I think there are eight species that I believe they're all threatened or endangered, some in Africa, some in Asia. A lot of them wind up in these wet markets in China. They are prized not just for their meats, but also for these scales, the scales that they carry, which are, are used in traditional medicine. I was at a wet market in Guangzhou, this must be 25 years ago. It was pretty horrifying. There was a bear carcass that was mostly stripped and all of a sudden, the Chinese man who was taking me around with a big grin said to me, we eat everything with four legs except the table. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's interesting um, because Guangzhou, southern China, where this is particularly a fashion, Guangzhou was where I was um, when I was doing my research also, city of uh, Guangzhou, the city of Guilin. And uh, one Chinese colleague of the scientists I was traveling with, uh, who was southern Chinese himself, as we were looking at these birds, that were on sale and bats that were, were on sale. Uh, he said to me, uh, we in Southern China, we eat everything that flies except an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get back to something that you said a little while ago, Andy, and that's people's lack of awareness about what they eat and how that potentially increases our risk of uh, zoonotic diseases. Well, I think uh, the, our dependence on animal foods is a major factor in, in climate change, in destruction of soils, in bringing us in contact with animals in a way that facilitate these spillovers of zoonotic diseases to humans. So that's an area where we do have choice, and maybe you know that's one we could work on. I don't tell people to become complete vegetarians or vegans, but I think we could start by reducing the amount of animal foods in the diet. That would be a big step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, absolutely. And, and the conditions, and I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a vegetarian. I aspire to becoming more vegetarian every week, and I'm working right. on that. But, um, but that's still aspirational. But I, I recognize the importance of eating less and less uh, meat and also eating less and less uh, meat produced in industrial scale factory farming situations, which carry some of their own risks and impacts. Um, you mentioned some, Andy, but, but the spillover of uh, zoonotic diseases is one of them. In some of these cases that I write about in my book, situations of factory scale, industrial scale 
uh, animal husbandry have contributed to the passage of, of viruses from wild animals into humans. Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. During this unprecedented time managing the physical and emotional challenges of the coronavirus, the Andrew Weil Center is here to support you. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. David, you mentioned that you're not a vegetarian, that you do eat meat. And Andy, you said that um, you suggest that people eat less meat, but don't suggest they necessarily become vegetarian or vegan. Can you tell our listeners what you think the healthiest meat would be to eat at this moment in history? Oh, that's hard. I think we could argue about what the best meat is. I mean, maybe wild game, but there are pros and cons about that. But I think, uh, I feel fairly certain that the worst meat that people can eat is beef. Uh, because I think that the ways that we're raising cows for food has a much more devastating environmental impact in terms of climate change, of uh, destruction of soil, pollution of water, and, and bringing animals and people in contact in a way that probably facilitate the, these development of these new diseases. The wild game is also complex, Andy, because yeah. um, and this is some, I'm asked about you know, bushmeat. We, we, you hear the term bushmeat, and bushmeat usually is applied to um, uh, wild animals eaten by people in African villages. And those might, be, those might be monkeys, they might be chimpanzees, they might be forest antelope. They might be porcupines, uh, but it has a, a sort of a negative on, onus to it, wild uh, bush meat. I live in Montana. My friends go out, shoot a deer, shoot an elk in the fall. We don't call that bush meat. We call that game, and it has sort of a positive, robust yeah. onus to it. But still, it's, it's eating wild animals. The ecosystem of Montana isn't anywhere near as biologically diverse as the ecosystem in a central African forest, and maybe that partly accounts for the fact that there are no known zoonotic pathogens that we're sure that you can get from the wild meat that is available in Montana, except now we're worrying about chronic wasting disease, which is a prion disease, not known to be transmissible to humans, but um, it has made me suspicious of of deer and elk meat in Montana because I've read enough about prions to know that I don't want to... I would agree with that too, and I, you know, we have we haven't entirely stopped being um, beef eaters, but we eat very little beef. Occasionally, uh, when we can get it, uh, an, a meat that I think highly of, if you're going to eat meat or red meat, um, is is bison. Bison farmed um, in a wild ranch pasture situation. So, for people who do want to become less dependent on eat and more plant focused on their diet, do you have any suggestions about how to make that transition? Well, I would say you be by get familiar with the range of plant teams out there. There's an enormous variety of soy products, not uh, refined and manipulated things like tempeh, for example. That's the first thing I would say is to find out what else is out there. And then rather than having meat be the centerpiece of a meal, food or an occasional food, and that you needn't have that as the main course. I became a, a first a lacto-vegetarian in the 1970s, and I, became a, I would serve meals to people and everybody would be looking around waiting for the main course to come. So that's what people need to unlearn to get out of that habit. Let me add to that because I'm in the midst of this journey, mm-hmm. um, and uh, think about this all the time with some with some guilt. But uh, as I say, I'm you know I'm not a full vegetarian now. But I would say that um, for any of those of us who are in the midst of this journey and we know which direction we want to move in and we should move in, which is away from meat. Um, First of all, don't wait for factory farmed pseudo meat. Right, <laughs> that's not the answer. Uh, just uh, just think about other tastes, and and I would say two other steps: get yourself a really good vegetarian cookbook mm-hmm. with 
spicy, interesting yep. recipes yep. and get a good bottle of wine to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I have two more suggestions. You mentioned contagion earlier. So one contagious idea in the United States is meatless Mondays, and that can perhaps be a new habit that people form. And another that's been popular is vegan before six. And we know that in both of those, the environmental benefit of just reducing that amount of meat consumption is actually substantial for the planet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. So that's why, Victoria, I tell people, you know, rather than tell people to become vegetarians, to do things in small steps, any steps in, the, in that direction are helpful. Yeah. You know what? I think about this, too, in, in sort of a practical way, and I hope it's not a smart aleck way. Um, this, is, this is related to my suggestion about get a good cookbook. I, I admire Paul McCartney in 10 different ways, <laughs> but I know that it would be easier for me to ve- be a vegetarian if I had his personal chef. <laughs> he would right. loan me right. if he would loan me his personal chef three or four days a week. I promise I would be vegetarian those days. Yes, I agree. I've had the lovely experience of sometimes going to health resorts that serve three delicious vegetarian meals a day, and it's easy there. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, tell me more about your thinking about the the human ecosystem the microbiome and the way the the choices that we make in the course of a day or the course of a year affect that and in turn affect the prospects of our health. Well, you know, the the microbiome, this is really one of the great revolutions in medical thinking that's happened. When I was in medical school, uh, I was taught that we had these organisms in our gut, that they helped with digestion, and that was about it. And the people that took... uh, I ate yogurt or took uh, acidophilus supplements were considered health nuts. Uh, and to see the change in thinking that's coming come up is just amazing that it turns out, as you said, we have more uh, microbial DNA in us than human DNA. Clearly, we're hybrid organisms. And also, the microbiome appears to be the, the major determinant of our interactions with the environment and probably also a great, has a great deal to do with our resistance to infection. Uh, and the way that potentially pathogenic germs behave if they get into us. Uh, It is also clear that the more diversity you have in your microbiome, the better off you are, Mm -hmm. and that this has a lot to do with how you eat, Uh, and that the more, you know, the tendency in our population to be eating more and more refined and processed manufactured food is one of the factors that's changed the microbiome for the worse. Mm-hmm. Other use of antibiotics, you know, that, that re- they wreak havoc with the microbiome and the gut. And I, you know, I still, although there's been a positive change in how they're used, I still think in great many instances, their, their use is unnecessary and the way their agriculture continues to be a real problem. So, you know, those, those factors, another one, uh, two other factors in our population, I think, have really sabotaged the microbiome, which are less obvious. One is the incredible rise in cesarean deliveries. You know that now one in three births in this country is done by cesarean. And nice. most of that is not for medical reasons. It's for convenience of doctor or patient. And when a baby is born vaginally, the organisms that colonize the gut come from the birth canal. When a baby is born by uh, C-section, the organisms that colonize the gut come from the mother's skin, a totally different population. So, you know, when you look at that in combination with the change in eating and antibiotic use, and the other one is decline of breastfeeding, which uh, contributes greatly to um, the breast breast milk contributes to the development of the organisms you want in the microbiome. So I think our microbiome has really suffered in this population, and that's something we need need to address. Another exciting thing about the microbiome is that it's introducing new therapies that would have been unimaginable. Uh, Fecal transplant as a way to perhaps cure diseases ranging from maybe more obvious like bowel diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, Mm -hmm. to depression, much less obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fecal transplant, I mean, as I understand it, it's a very, very specific, very informed, very targeted sort of microbiomic therapy. And even though it has sort of an unsavory name, it makes to me a whole lot more sense than the idea that if you have problems with your digestion, you can go to your local uh, organic co-op store like and buy some, a 
a, a, a container of acidophilus milk off the shelf and that's going to fix your, your particular <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> to follow on from that, you mentioned going to medical school. Um, you, when did you go to medical school? I graduated in 1968, so I was 64 to 68. Okay. It's my impression, I've never been anywhere near a medical school. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's my impression, and I keep asking about this, yeah. that, um, that Darwin is not taught in medical school. No. no. It seems to me that that is a glaring mistake. What, what is your thought? Yeah, I think that the whole uh, perspective of evolutionary biology on health and medicine is just is fascinating. And uh, there's a lot of insights to be gained there. W what are you working on now, David? What's your next project? Well, uh, I'm just finishing a piece related to COVID-19 for The New Yorker that'll be out next week. Um, and my larger project, I was working on a book, um, was, and I'll explain that, on uh, for Simon & Schuster on evolution and cancer, on cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon, the, the whole field of, of cancer evolutionary biology, which is, um, which is little known except with a relatively small group of researchers, but it's been fascinating to me oh. for, for a dozen years. And it's an important perspective on cancer. But in the last month, Simon and & Schuster, and as recently as February, I spent a month in Tasmania uh, doing research on the Tasmanian devil, which is a, a carnivore, marsupial carnivore that is that is dying off from a genuinely contagious cancer, an infectious uh -huh. form of cancer, uh -huh. and that's um, at one end of the spectrum of strange phenomena that are related to the evolutionary potential of tumor population, tumor cell populations. But Simon and Schuster has asked me, for the love of God, would you please push that book to the back of the desk and do a book for us on COVID nineteen? Uh -huh. So it's I, I generally my operating principle has been write about things that other people are not writing about. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't apply in yeah. this situation. Every publisher in New York is going to have a COVID nineteen book, but Simon and Schuster has asked me to do theirs. So that's okay. not, and of course it's it's important for us to know about the origins because knowing about the origins of this pandemic is necessary to help us prevent the next one. Well, thank you so much, David, for taking this time to talk with us. Uh, it's been fascinating. I feel like I've learned so much from you over the course of the last 45 minutes. Well, it's a pleasure for me. Pleasure to interact with you and to inter interact with Andy and to learn some things from Andy, which, um, uh, which I certainly have. So well, let's stay connected and yes. good luck with your new book. Thank you. All right. Take care. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs. Learn more about topics featured on the Body of Wonder podcast and how to apply them to your everyday health with My Wellness Coach, a free mobile app from the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Download today at mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu. That's mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu.